good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Baer. I'm Dean of the College of Forest Resources at the University of Washington. And I wish to welcome all of you to this 15th Denman Forest Reissue Series entitled Trust and Transition, Perspectives on Native American Forestry. We look forward to an exciting and informative program today as we discuss a series of issues dealing with the stewardship of the natural resources located on the forest lands managed by Native American tribes across America in cooperation with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. This subject is in keeping with the purpose of the Denman Forest Reissue Series, which is to provide information and discussion on timely forestry and natural resource issues, and to inform and educate landowners, professional citizens groups, students, and the general public. These programs are made possible through the support of the Denman Endowment for Student Excellence in Forest Resources in our College of Forest Resources. And they support the college's vision of world-class and internationally recognized knowledge relevant to environmental and natural resource issues. The mission of our college is to study and investigate the sustainability and functionality of complex natural resource and environmental systems in both natural and managed environments using an interdisciplinary approach across multiple spatial and temporal scales to include our urban, suburban, and wildland landscapes. In our college, we focus on programs in sustainable forestry, sustainable urban ecosystems, and sustainable forest enterprises. Sustainability serves as the goal for all of our programs, and we use the term to include all resources, such as timber, shrubs, water, wildlife, or insects, for example, to consider the needs of future generations as well as those of the present. And we strive for a dynamic equilibrium that balances ecological functions and conditions with social, cultural, and economic factors. This slide illustrates the notion of the dynamic balance across the just mentioned metrics. And even though the ellipses are shown as being about equal in area, it should be clear that depending upon ownership objectives, it is likely that one set of metrics may be assigned more importance in the decision making process than another. For example, tribal land managers would likely place considerable weight on the social cultural measures of success relative to the balance sought by other forest land owners. Not made clear by this simple diagram uh, is the shift over time in the weight applied to the different metrics as landowner and societal preferences change. Today, we wish to focus on a variety of issues related to the stewardship of forest managed by tribal natural resource managers in collaboration with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We will hear presentations this afternoon covering three general topics. A national overview of tribal forestry issues, followed by some talks that look at the opportunities and challenges facing tribal forest managers, and then some discussion of forest health and bioenergy issues illustrating the balance between ecology and economics that was referred to in one of the prior slides. These presentations will discuss many issues, and I'm just going to list a couple of the ones that I'm pretty sure most of the speakers will touch on in one way or the other, because these affect the management of the tribal forest lands across America. One will probably be drawing your attention to the lack of funding, funding from the federal government, which is a huge impediment to the success of tribal stewardship. Other issues will include clarifying the complex relationship between the tribes and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Forest health concerns are widespread across most of the inland west and affect many, if not all, of the forest landowners in that part of the country. Some speakers will address the complexity of tribal forest management. How do we satisfy the numerous economic, social, and cultural goals that the various tribes have articulated? 
What is the role of third party forest certification in the management of these tribal forest lands? And lastly, some speakers will address the need to broaden the concept of sustainability to include all natural resources as I defined it earlier. Before we turn to a discussion of these topics and we get to our prime speakers, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers for joining us at this event. Some have traveled considerable distance to be with us today and we greatly appreciate their presence here with us. I also wish to acknowledge the assistance of people and organizations who helped us put this program together. First, the Intertribal Timber Council. Second, Dr. Gary Morishima from the Quinault Indian Nation. Mary Parker from the Macaw Nation who will be our moderator. And Larry Mason from the University of Washington College of Forest Resources. We could not have done this program without the assistance of these people and, and the Intertribal Timber Council. So joining us today, today then are speakers to address the three themes that I outlined earlier and I'm sure they'll address other complex issues as well. And they come to us from several tribes, from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and from the University of Washington. Our topic is trust and transition perspectives on Native American forestry. And our moderator is Meredith Mary Parker, CEO of the Macaw Forestry Enterprises. I just wanted to say a word about Mary before she comes up here. She's, in addition to her responsibilities with the Macaw, she is um, also the president of the Board of Trustees for the Macaw Cultural and Research Center, president of the Nia Bay Chamber of Commerce, a member of the tribe's election board, and has represented the Macaw tribe on the executive board of directors to the Inner Tribal Timber Council since 1990. And she's also chair of the ITC's operations committee. And as I mentioned, she was also instrumental in helping us put this program together. So Mary, I'll turn the podium over to you to introduce the speakers. The first speaker of our second session, Opportunities and Challenges, is Guy Kapoman, or Nimoth. Guy Kapoman has served on the Quinault Indian Nation Business Committee for the last 10 years, the last four as the Vice President. His areas of responsibility include land and timber, business development, and tribal sovereignty. He is a member of the Intertribal Timber Council's Executive Board. Guy has a degree from Pacific Northwest College of Arts and is an accomplished artist. Guy is a hereditary chief, proud descendant of two signers of the Quinault River Treaty, Nishiguach and Kape. He is a spiritual leader and a traditionalist who has enjoyed participating in tribal canoe journeys for several years. He also considers himself to be the best bull elk hunter in the whole Northwest, <laughs> as well as the finest canoe carver that ever lived. Guy is the husband to the lovely Lita Sue and the father to five wonderful children, James, Anthony, Cecil, Ilya, and Carl. Guy will speak this uh, afternoon on a portrait of our land. Guy. Thank you, Mary. On behalf of the Quinault Indian Nation, thank those that are responsible for this series for allowing us this opportunity here today. So thank you all. My land and my home is 220,000 acres in size. It's the Quinault Indian Reservation located on the Olympic Peninsula, an area dominated by federal and state lands, as you can see all around here. The Quinault Reservation has 23 miles of coastline, has two major rivers, the Quinault and the Queets, that flow through it. For countless generations, our culture and economies were sustained and are still sustained by fish. These fish you see here on the screen are what we call julos or blueback. And uh, these are very famous due to its uh, unique runtime and also the, the high fat content that these fish have. They spend their lives both as juveniles and adults in Lake Quinault, which is located on the eastern half of our reservation. Our land is nestled in, in the foothills of the Olympic Mountains. We, we rely on the forest as well as the fish to sustain ourselves. Classic 
coastal rainforests are nurtured by, by 90 to 140 inches of rain per year. These lands provide both food and medicines and also fuel still to this day. And while we are a fish people, we also are people of the cedar. We rely upon western red, red cedar to this day to provide shelter, to provide transportation, and also ceremonial use as well, canoes, uh, baskets. For countless generations, we have lived off of the bounty of the land. And then in the, in the 1800s, our way of life began to change. Isaac Stevens, who you see here, was appointed to negotiate treaties to open the way for settlement. Our treaty was signed in 1855, and we relinquished claims to millions of acres of land in exchange for a reservation, homeland, and promises by the United States to protect our way of life. The Quinault Reservation was set aside in 1891 as a permanent homeland for my people. The, the north boundary, what you see here in uh, yellow, was excluded from the reservation to avoid inconveniencing the settlers who had moved in that area already. While our reservation was heavily timbered and poorly suited for agriculture, in the early 1900s, the federal government launched a program to force us to abandon our way of life, which was fish, and turn us into farmers. The only thing that that land grows is hemlock trees. A major part of this transformation involved breaking up our tribal reservation into individually owned 80 acre allotments. All of this without uh, consultation of us, the tribe. By 1934, our re reservation was entirely allotted. A, a single tribally owned forest property was broken up into 2,340 individually owned forested allotments which were held in trust by the United States. This established a fiduciary relationship between the United States and the individually Indian property owners. Over time, land ownership of allotments be becomes increasingly complex as undivided property interests are passed from generation to generation. So now, as many as several hundred people may own a small fractional interest in a single allotment. In the early 1900s, settlers and developers wanted our timber. Using railroads for transportation, thousands of acres and millions of board feet were harvested without a thought to re reforesting the land or protecting its productivity. Over time, huge brush fields replaced our forests. The railroads built by four major logging companies marched from west to east, south of the Quinault River, eventually reaching Lake Quinault. The, the loggers prized, of course, the red cedar, the tree of life for us, the Quinault. Less valuable spe species were cut and left on the ground, leaving vast clear cuts and mountains of slash behind. By the 1930s, tractors replaced the railroads and selective logging became the buzzword of the day. But the results were much the same. Loggers prized, high graded, the most valuable trees and the others were left to blow down. High lead logging and trucking soon became the norm. As you can see these large spruce trees here. In the 1950s, the Bureau of Indian Affairs left or, or let long-term timber sale contracts which allowed clear cutting of 30,000 acre areas at prices favorable to the logging industry. Entire watersheds were cut over in a short time. Piles of logging debris were left behind. Fields of, of brush expanded over thousands of acres of once productive forest lands. Streams that supported large runs of salmon and steelhead were clogged with debris and silt. Logging slash impeded the establishment of a new forest blocked streams to the passage of salmon and resulted in large wildfires. Through this process, the vast rainforest that had once covered our land vanished. An average of 220 tons of logging slash per acre was left behind in the areas covered by the long-term timber contracts that were let during the 1950s. In addition to the resource management problems we faced, 
fractionation and alienation of reservation lands were making land ownership ever more complex. Problems with timber management on our reservation had become so notorious that uh, Senator Newberger convened hearings before a Senate committee on Quinault timber sales from 1955 to 1957. After years of suffering, the final straw came in 1971 when the BIA, BIA allowed stumpage rates to be reduced from their already below market values, which at this time there was strong tribal leadership. James Jackson on the right and Joe Delacruz worked together to forge a vision and an action plan to attain it. Our, our concerns included damage to fisheries, fallow forest lands, poor prices for timber, and environmental damage, which we still see results from to this day. The future challenges confronting tribal leadership were and are daunting. Diminished value and deteriorating resource base, conflicting priorities of in individuals versus the tribe, and increasing complexity of land ownership, which impedes the ability to manage the land and leads to escalating cost of federal administration. In response to desecration of our tribal beach, the Quinault Nation closed its beaches to access to the, to the public in 1969. And in 1971, we blockaded roads to prevent logging from continuing. These actions led to a great deal of media coverage, which is what, what we were after also, and also set the stage for legal action. In a series of cases that eventually reached the U.S. Supreme Court, the United States found, was found to be liable for damages caused by a breach of fiduciary trust responsibilities. These events were occurring at the same time that a new federal policy was emerging, as you heard the previous speakers talk about. Indian self-determination this policy replaced federal termination and paternalism by one which enabled tribes to assume greater responsibility for managing our own affairs. Under self-determination, tribes could set their own priorities and continue and manage programs to meet the needs of our own communities. At Quinault, we took advantage of this opportunity and built our own forestry program from the roots up. We consulted with industry, government, and academia to devise an approach to restore the health and productivity of our land. An example, we used satellites and field surveys to quickly gather the data on the condition of our land. You can see the, the, the dark is, is the old growth, and, and the red is, is the hardwood, and the, the blue is the brush fields. We also solicited the attention and support of Congress and the administration. You could see uh, Don Bonker at, at left and the Interior Secretary at the time, uh, Cecil Andrus, was then uh, Chairman Delacruz. This increased attention and enabled us to institute an aggressive program to rehabilitate our land. Shortly after the Secretary's visit, we were able to broadcast burn nearly 2,000 acres a year in a patch quilt pattern on the re reservation to reduce the wildfire hazard and open spots for tree planting. At its peak, our reforestation program planted 1.5 million trees per on about 3,000 acres per year. We, we planted tree species suited to conditions found on our land to, to establish new second growth forests. We developed a tree improvement program to provide seeds from trees with superior growth. This allowed us to replant our forest using the trees best suited to our lands. We de developed a training process to bring our members up into management and uh, supervisory roles with, within forestry. We built our own GIS shop, but our, but Establishing a, a program to rehabilitate our forest was not enough. We needed a strategy to restore our land. It, it had been 
long been clear that we needed to consolidate our land, our land base to restore the productivity of our natural resources. We embarked on a path to restore the north boundary, the, the land which you saw in the survey, which was left out. And restoration of, of the north boundary has enabled us to make sustainable inroads in restoring our land as a productive forest property and provide a secure homeland for our future. Today, we have reclaimed nearly a third of the land base. While our forestry program was born from controversy, we have used self-determination to build working partnerships that enable us to cooperatively improve management of our resources. And we now operate under a forest management plan that includes benefits to maintain the ecological health of our forest, education for our youth, and measures to, to protect fish, which is, is the backbone of the Quinaults, and provide opportunities for, for our tribal guides to allow others to enjoy our land. Our plan also protects the threatened and endangered species. You see the spotted owl and the bald eagle. There, there's that elk we referred to at the beginning, and also food and uh, medicines that we still use. And see the Indian tea, the devil's club. We do this for our people and our land, for they are one and we are one. And our leaders, we, we have been blessed to have talented minds in our leadership that have sacrificed much of their lives in making sure we have a future. For the generations yet born, for our future leadership that you see here, from the time of the first moon till the time of the last sun, this is my land. Thank you all. Our next speaker is um, John Wakanda, from, uh, Isleta, is a tribal member of Isleta Pueblo in New Mexico. Raised on the Isleta Pueblo Reservation, he graduated from New Mexico State University in 1985 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Natural Resource Economics. He then graduated from Colorado State University in 1992 with a Master of Forestry degree obtained through the Bureau of Indian Affairs Bridge to Profession Training Program. Currently, he is the BIA Southwest Regional Forester, a position held since 1996. Previously, previously was the Bureau's Regional Woodland, Forest, Woodland Management Forester from 1994 to 1996. Other relevant Bureau of Forestry experience includes work in forest development at the Northern Pueblos Agency and fire management staff positions at those Southern Pueblo agencies. He also worked on tribal economic development projects dealing with agricultural business enterprises for several Pueblo tribes in New Mexico. Most recent project emphasis has been devoted to solving forest product utilization challenges in the Southwest, including woody biomass energy development. John has also actively participated and represented tr local tribes in the development of a New Mexico forest and watershed health plan and recent forest restoration and recent forest restoration. He principles with many state, federal, industry, and environmental interest groups. Uh, John's um, session or his uh, presentation in this session will be on the cooperative forest management and tribal partnerships. John. Thank you, Mary. I'm here to talk to you about cooperative forest management and partnerships. Uh, you've heard that several times already today, and I just want to reemphasize it's a subject that I want to talk about because I think it's very valuable, and I've heard examples before, uh, and I'm sure you're going to hear examples after me about the numerous partnerships that tribes have engaged in to help do effective forest management on our lands. And I, I believe it is one of the most valuable tools that I think we have. We share common missions, common goals, common objectives. Tribes are no different. We're here to manage the resource for our people, and I believe we cannot do that alone. So I want to focus a little bit on some partnerships that I believe are important and maybe can, you can take as an example of how things are done in the Southwest. I know it's, it's a little bit far removed from here, but I think their relevance may be uh, valuable. Uh, one of the first uh, partnerships that I want to really emphasize and think is really valuable is the intertribal connection we all serve. And uh, Nolan Colgrove, the president of ITC, who was here to open our session this afternoon, uh, is the president of Intertribal Timber Council. Many tribes collectively, I think, serve 
a bigger purpose when we gather. Uh, certainly we're here today with some of my counterparts and my fellow professionals to talk about tribal forestry. And tribes have unified themselves to, I think, uh, strengthen our, our emphasis, strengthen our voice. And I believe as a mission, together we need to continue to do that. Um, so you can see the Intertribal Timber Council has recognized its value of combining forces among academic uh, resource professionals who, say, who serve and uh, share common examples and common missions. They also help to bridge the gap between uh, industry and our local communities. Uh, the missions that ITC serve are certainly great and uh, we also look for them to uh, join us together to respect educate and share ideas, management practices. We, we not only uh, serve as a entity, it's, it's a brotherhood. You know, we, we like to see each other and, and come together and it certainly serves as an opportunity for us to see each other and share ideas uh, during our yearly symposium and, and sessions like this today. Partnerships are, are not just one-way streets. They're two-way avenues, two-way uh, two dirt roads, I guess, for us foresters. Um, a lot of times, uh, tribes uh, join partnerships to gain information and to collect things to take back home and put on the ground. But a large value of our partnerships is sharing our information to other land managers and, and to other folks on, uh, who we work with. A uh, common uh, theme these days is traditional ecological, ecological knowledge. And the way I term that is basically practicing what we've done for years on the ground. Um, these folks right here are, are Plains Indians, who I imagine are the first prescribed fire specialists that were out on the, on the landscape, implementing and conducting fires for land, uh, land management purposes, but also mainly for sustaining their own lives and culture. Uh, we do that today. We still continue those traditional land uh, scape and land management activities. Although they may were not trained, they probably don't have burn boss qualifications that we have to do in, in our federal organization, but they certainly lit fires just like we do today to achieve management objectives just like we, we try and do today. So partnerships are a two-way street. I hope that our partnerships are effective and that we can contribute as much as we gain uh, in, in joining these relationships. Uh, as, a, as a forester in the BIA, uh, it was mentioned earlier about the re unique relationship we have with tribes. Uh, the BIA is the federal arm, sort of the trustee, to ensure that uh, we take care and manage the natural resources for the tribes. It's been my personal goal to try and effectively develop these relationships um, so that we can hopefully all, all do our jobs better. Um, one of the main things is, I think, is that hopefully my uh, traditional resource background, I was born on the reservation, grew up, and my family still is, is raised there. We, we traditionally in the Southwest are farmers. I, got into forestry a little bit later on, but uh, it's, it's being able to share um, our philosophies, our background, all cultures, to those who respect it and value it. So that's part of my mission here today is hopefully share some of my ideas and some of my experiences with you. I, I want to share a little bit about uh, the value of partnerships and share a little bit of uh, cooperative forest management um, that I've been involved with. Uh, a little bit far removed from Seattle, but hopefully their examples will be important. Uh, one of the main agencies that are, is our uh, partner is the Forest Service. They too have an extension of their agency that serves to directly interact with tribes. It's their tribal, tribal uh, uh, management program, which has basically evolved through the years with their interaction with tribes. Uh, hopefully it's their mission to work to get to, together with tribes on a government-to-government -government relationship, not as a, uh, one of their public, but one as a, their equal. Um, there are folks and programs organizing the Forest Service who hopefully share that same mission. Uh, their exposure to the tribes is certainly to enhance the resource management capabilities, but also to allow better access to Forest Service lands, uh, which in some cases used to be traditional homelands. Tribes used to rely on forest products, uh, medicinal plants, and uh, the various things that come from the Forest Service. And it's uh, a large part of this Forest Service mission is to allow tribes better access to that. One other emphasis of the Forest Service is the implementation of tribal uh, focused programs. One of them that I've been actively participating in in the Southwest with the Muscular Apache tribe is being able to take part of stewardship contracting. 
One of the other recent acts that has been passed nationally is the Tribal Forest Land Protection Act. This act allows um, uh, better access to uh, Forest Service lands and a better communication relationship between the federal agency, Forest Service, and tribes. Basically, a stewardship contract, it's a performance-based contract in which tasks are combined to implement a land management treatment, emphasizes quality and results, and reducing management costs for exchanging goods and services. One of the, one of the best assets uh, of this ability is tribes who already have tribal enterprises, usually be, can be considered as a contractor, can negotiate with the Forest Service to be able to do land management treatments on Forest Service land in exchange for goods and services to helpfully uh, put into their enterprises and uh, produce uh, forest products for sale in hopes to, of, of implementing and supporting tribal economies. The benefits to tribes, as I mentioned, it improves forest conditions adjacent to reservation boundaries. Uh, hopefully, it also allows the ability to interact with the planning, uh, planning activities to be able to implement and uh, uh, provide tribal goals and objectives that are incorporated into the plan, into the project, supports economic enterprises uh, for new and expanded tribal industries. Another benefit of the stewardship contracting is that tribal communities uh, may be better protected by these treatments if they're adjacent to reservation boundaries. Uh, they may be implemented on large landscape scales. Allows us to work with our uh, informed partnerships so that we can also do similar treatments. Or they may listen to us and, and actively plan together what we try to do on the reservation versus uh, combining the efforts across the border on, on a Forest Service land so that we achieve large landscape scale objectives. Uh, we also are able to hopefully participate in multi-party monitoring uh, organizations uh, or activities. Uh, some of the tribes in the Southwest have begun active dialogue where they're actually, actively soliciting tribal input to help monitor projects that go on and off the reservation. So that's a key relationship that I think is able in these uh, stewardship contracts. Uh, one of the other major benefits is the passage of the Tribal Forest Land Protection Act, and this was in uh, 2003. In essence, the Tribal Forest Land Protection Act, which was part of the Healthy Forest Restoration Amendments and bills that were passed through Congress, basically allows tribes to be able to form a better and stronger relationship with the BLM and the Forest Service. It allows uh, land management activities to be conducted uh, to enter into formal agreements with tribes. If tribes have the ability to implement these projects, if they have an industry or a workforce that they can provide these agencies, that they form a stronger relationship with these two agencies. And in essence, what's important here is that it allows the tribe to be a full partner in activities on agency lands that are adjacent to reservation boundaries. Um, it, there was a, a large issue before the passage of this act about the inability of tribes to input and influence land management activities adjacent to the reservation boundaries. There's an example, and I think some John maybe have had it in his earlier presentation about the differences of land management activities uh, versus uh, an activity a, a scenario on the reservation versus across the fence. Uh, tribes have often had the ability to do uh, more proactive land treatment projects on the reservation side because of various uh, reasons, uh, mostly having to uh, deal with a streamlined uh, planning process and environmental compliance process versus having the Forest Service conduct and go through litigation and getting stalled in courts. Um, this Tribal Forest Land Protection Act hopefully avoids that. One of the main emphasis happening in the Southwest that I've been involved with is the challenge dealing with the uh, decline of forest industries. I'm not sure if it's this way in the Northwest, probably not. I, I think it, it's been suffering, it, it's been a climate across the country, but in the Southwest it's been accelerated and uh, certainly more noticeable to us because we never really da did have uh, forest industries. It's a partnership that we've developed, uh, strengthening our ability to hopefully hold on to the last bits of remnant industry in our, in our, in our region. It's also hopefully dealing with and finding solutions on what to do with our products that have been considered waste material, thinning material, uh, and, and things that have uh, had very 
relatively little value. Here's a picture of a tribal sawmill in New Mexico. The Mescalero Apache uh, owns two sawmills, and then they are the last two large sawmill con uh, in the country, at least in New Mexico, um, still existing that are under tribal ownership. I belong to an organization representing tribes uh, known as the Southwest Sustainable Forest Partnership. Uh, this is our mission here. Basically, it's representatives from communities, small industry, things that we call mom and pop uh, businesses that still try and actively support utilization of forest products. I feel it's important that we join these. Tribes have been active participants in able to succeed and receive grant monies through this organization. I'm sure that examples of these organizations uh, exist across the country, but I believe um, it's time that we uh, step up and, and hopefully uh, recognize that we, we have a lot to gain from entering into organizations that help support our tribal communities and tribal economies. One other activity uh, that we try and uh, deal with, of course, is the uh, residual challenge. What do you do with this material? Uh, yes, we know it, it provides forest health and, and promotes uh, resilient forests, but yet uh, there's a lot of material there that tribes still continue to, to perceive as being valuable, and we want to find uh, solutions for utilization of this material. And that's where uh, organizations like the Southwest Sustainable Forest Partnership try to uh, find solutions to is, is finding value to, the, to what we consider waste material. One of the values that I see emerging, and I'm sure it's also emerging in your minds here across the country, is biomass development. Now this is recent to tribes and tribal communities, although we've always lived with that, uh, the wood being the source of heat uh, and uh, utilize, utilize, utilized for cooking. Uh, we're pushing that to the next stage, hopefully joining organizations and, and joining partnerships to help tribes across the country capture value of what had been considered waste material and you turning it into energy. I'm sure all of you uh, are know, uh, know and maybe be involved in renewable energy projects and biomass utilization. Uh, our partnerships are, are joining forces to do that. Some of the steps that I think are important to uh, this strategy, uh, biomass assisting tribes, is joining forces again with other tribes and seeking opportunities partnerships with industry. Certainly we can't do this alone. We need, we need the, the uh, partnership of technology, uh, bringing that to the, to the tribes, um, states, feds, academia, who actually are finding solutions to this challenge, uh, joining hands and getting, getting answers from them. Interagency inter agreements. You know, we share common challenges and the same uh, problems. Uh, we need to join forces through formalized agreements to help one another, uh, hopefully seeking funding that, that might be a, a result of that. Workforce development, transfer technology, and one of the big things is building the tribal capacity um, through examples of other tribes that have gone through this process, and we'll hear a little bit this afternoon about tribes who have, who have sought that path. One of the important relationships I see is, is the relationship between the state and tribes. Now, in, in history, uh, these relationships have been contentious, mostly relating to tribal sovereignty. But in New Mexico, we've joined hands and have come up together and have been part of, tribes have been part of the, the New Mexico governor who has uh, made uh, watershed and, and forest health uh, one of his top priorities. He convened a group of which tribes were very strongly represented to come up with the New Mexico Forest and Watershed Health Plan. Uh, we, we dealt with uh, hopefully restoring natural processes, uh, restoration of the forest, and dealing with the uh, severity, wildfire and drought situations, and hopefully strengthening communities to be able to deal with those a little bit better. The principles that we came up with basically are to hopefully uh, develop a zone of agreement where controversy, delays, appeals, and litigation are significantly reduced. Uh, basically should be driven by ecological principles that we all agree upon. Um, this large group uh, developed 18 restoration principles, and uh, I don't list all 18 of them here, but they're available on the uh, New Mexico Forest Restoration Principle uh, uh, website. You can Google that and come up with the 18 principles of which tribes were fully supportive of, and uh, it was a great uh, 
endeavor by the governor of New Mexico to put us together. In essence, I want to tell you all about, about what I feel about partnerships and their value to us. We cannot do this alone. And it's, it's forums like this that I think allow us to share information and helpfully gain information and collect and, and meet one another, which I think is the real value of, of, of partnerships. I want to thank you today for this opportunity. And here is a, a saying that I found hopefully kind of strengthens our, our, uh, our ability to understand what partnerships are all about. We can't do this alone. So thank you very much and uh, pleasure to be here. The third presentation in our the second series on opportunities and challenges for Indian forestry is going to be co-presented by two partners, uh, Terry Grenocker and Terry Williams from the Tulalip tribes. I'll introduce them both right now. Terry Grenocker has been with the Tulalip forest manager for 26 years. He is also commissioned. He is also a commissioned police officer who enforces reservation laws and regulations. Terry has developed and implemented three forest management plans that have served as the foundation for resource protection and development, as well as providing income and employment for the Tulalip Tribe's forest economy. Terry is also a proud graduate of the University of Washington Forestry Program. And Terry Williams is the Fisheries and Natural Resources Commissioner for the Tulalip Tribes near Marysville, Washington. He served as the first director of the American Indian Environmental Office of the EPA and has been a longtime member of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and the Southern Panel of the Pacific, Pacific Salmon Commission. He is a recipient of the Washington State Environmental Award and the Seventh Generation Legacy Award. He was recently appointed to the governor, to Governor Gregoire's Climate Change Challenge Advisory Team. During his career, Terry has championed the need to protect natural resources and the rights of indigenous people through the Convention of Biodiversity. Terry will speak about forestry issues confronting tribes in western Washington who have small land bases of their own. And again, this session is on forestry and small reservations in western Washington. The Tulalip Reservation is located five miles north of Everett, Washington, on the east side of Puget Sound. The reservation is approximately 22,000 acres in size. The tribes and its members own approximately 12,200 acres of the reservation, of which 9,100 acres are currently being managed in forest lands. The average precipitation in this area is 35 inches of rain a year. The forest site class on average is the Douglas fir 50 year site index of 120. Our annual allowable cut for the reservation through our new management plan is 2,738,000 board feet. The map on the right is the forest lands classification map. The largest land base you see in the classification is called multiple use. That's where most of our management is, is done on the reservation. The slide you're seeing now, this is our forest age class slide. The age classes are from zero to one, over 100 years in age. Most of the land is in the age class, classes from zero to 30 years because of harvest and regeneration. The age class from 26 to 30 years is where we are currently doing our commercial thinning operations. Toledo Forest Management has multiple goals. These include providing revenue for the tribes, providing recreational opportunities for its members, protecting the health of the forest and preventing fires, providing opportunities for tribal members to harvest forest products for cultural and spiritual use. The table on the left shows past timber harvest volumes, values in acres from 1994 to 2004. Over this period of time, 13,882,000 board feet was harvested with a stumpage value of $3.7 million from 900 acres. A lot of this land was very low valued land and we've replanted that land to uh, increase the capacity of the land. The table on the right shows the acres of tribal trust forest land and the volume of available timber from our current inventory. The lower part of this table is the forested acres available on a lot of lands 
and the timber volume available for harvest. We manage both the tribal and the allotted lands on the reservation. Uh, it's approximately, as you can see, the distribution of the size of the, the lands. It's uh, approximately 20% allotted lands, mostly tribal land on Tulalip Reservation. The Tulalip Forestry Program has worked closely with the Bureau of Indian Affairs forestry staff in the past years in order to improve the tribe's forest management and the management of the lands. We need to continue this relationship into the future. We need to provide educational opportunities for our forestry staff. We hope to continue with their development. We have developed and are currently working to improve the forest activities application. Uh, this is for tribal members that own fee land on the reservation. There's becoming more and more of them that want to practice forestry and they want to do it in a, a sound scientific way by making application through the tribe uh, to develop their properties. Thank you for the opportunity to present this brief overview and I'm going to turn it over to my friend Terry. And again, thank you for the invitation to be a part of this process. And we want to thank the sponsors uh, who are developing this program to invite us to talk about the, the things that are important to us. The, the bear grass, uh, basket grass, sword fern, western red cedar, cattail, marsh teas, these were all just a, a, a few of the many uh, different types of cultural uh, plants or species that are important to our existence. One of the things that uh, I've looked at in my 25 years of working for Tulalip is uh, our surrounding landscape and how it's changing. Uh, climate change and population growth are the two major changes that are affecting us with deco shifts and surface water timing abundance and uh, decreased access. Or, uh, looking at our ability to get on the landscape and harvest uh, the things that are sustaining our, our people on a daily basis. Uh, with that, I, for the tribe, and I, I met with our council uh, this last winter and talked to them about our future. And I indicated that at the rate we're going in climate and population growth, that sustaining our ability to gather and practice our culture through the next 25 years is going to be extremely difficult and past the 25 years, maybe not even possible. So we're developing a strategic plan to look at how we protect our people in the coming generations to be able to continue to survive uh, uh, through, through planning and, and implementation of, of work that allow us to go out and uh, restore both on our reservation and off-reservation in usual and custom fishing areas. Uh, the first phase is working with our community and bringing in our population to talk to us about what's important in terms of uh, plants. We have about 150 different plants that our people are still using on a daily basis and uh, looking at the abundance of these species to see if they can sustain um, the uh, types of uses that we're doing. The second phase is looking at assessing the data gaps, what types of information we've collected, what we haven't uh, collected, and what we need to look at in the future, including uh, conducting multi-departmental planning processes, well, like with our uh, health department, our utilities, or others who are all a part of uh, managing our resources. And the third, uh, third phase is the implementation. In partnerships, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, a number of the uh, federal agencies are um, available to us to work with. One, in a case study we're going through now, developing an MOU with the U.S. Forest Service, is that we're negotiating an agreement that allows us to be a part of that landscape management, uh, to look at our trust resources. You know, for an example, uh, with the tribes in the Northwest, one of the uh, shortages we're, we're seeing now is that of huckleberries. And so we're, we're looking at how we, uh, in the Forest Service, can better manage those huckleberry fields and do restoration and, and help to increase abundance. We're also looking at the potential of land trust to work with other partners, uh, whether they're landowners or um, other organizations, 
that can um, look at a landscape and sort out what our, uh, our joint goals are and find a way to uh, manage those lands differently in a way that sustains our culture. One uh, company we're working with right now, Sierra Pacific, is uh, a company where we have agreements with for access to our tribal members for hunting and other activities and gathering. Land acquisition is another um, potential, and we've been looking at different lands in our watershed uh, to be incorporated into our cultural sustainability plan. And looking at the lands that are available, we're, we're looking at the watershed as a whole, looking at the elevations and the different structures or types of species throughout the watershed, trying to identify what's important and where we need to increase abundances of plants or animals. Uh, the purchase of land and uplands for small-scale sustainable forestry is another uh, goal that we have in terms of not only for economy and for our um, employment for our population, but also where we can plan uh, different types of plants or animals for uh, cultural resources. In conclusion, well, Tulalip is a small reservation. We have a small land, land base that we're rapidly becoming a suburb of Seattle. And as you see the population surrounding us, it becomes very obvious why we need to, to think about our future in a way to uh, construct a plan that will assure a population that uh, our needs can be met. We have uh, one, one flower now that has been used for medicines in the past that is so rare that our staff, when, when they find these, uh, use a GPS locator just to identify where it's at and, and to um, allow us to, to look at what the conditions are around this type of plant. One of the things we're finding, I think, with this plant in particular is the changes of hydrology. As we've seen uh, the climate uh, influence uh, the flows of the river and the effects of um, uh, land use so with quick runoff, we find that our um, aquifers are not being replenished. And as aquifers drop, the seepage on the shoreline, the shoreline uh, drops and affects the ability for these plants to exist. It dries out. So we, we uh, look into the future in terms of what types of information do we need to have to create conditions so plants and animals can exist? And what, what types of uh, management will it take for us to look at our populations and give them some assurance that um, past the next 25 years, into the next generation, that uh, the types of activities that they're, they're looking for can exist? On our reservation forest lands, we're currently, as Terry Mention managing into perpetuity for our generations and tribal members. One of the things that Terry didn't mention was the fact that as a forester coming here 26 years ago, realized that the cedar trees had been removed from our reservation. And, and different than most timber companies when he was uh, developing plans and replanting um, the, the forest on our landscape that had been pretty much stripped bare, about a third of the plantings were cedar. And that wasn't for timber harvest as much as it was for our future longhouses, canoes, and totems. The key component of management on the reservation has been access to culturally significant resources and places. Over the years, we've spent, uh, since the reservation's created, we've had to resort a lot within our boundaries. And as we said, 22,000 acres isn't a lot. Uh, because of off-reservation problems a lot earlier having to do with prejudice and access to resources. Over the years, we've improved on our ability to, to govern and to, to get engaged with other governments outside our reservation. In, in the Snohomish, Gaikomish, Nokomi watersheds, we have about 27 different jurisdictions that we work with. Within that, we now have been able to uh, gather agreements that allow us to, to have access to a, a broader landscape, including on the Snohomish watershed, we have a salmon recovery plan. And in that plan, we've now incorporated with the agreement of the other jurisdictions, 
that the restoration that occurs that we're helping to do, we have access to putting in tribal plants and resources that, that our people have access to harvest. In fact, in the last six years of the Snohomish Watershed Forum, we've collected um, about $6 million worth of federal estate funds to the restoration process. And we've taken those $6 million and matched it with others, with landowners, with uh, foundations, and uh, different funding sources that are available to um, attain $46 million worth of restoration. So we've done quite well. And um, now with that, we have a formal agreement that says when restoration is being accomplished throughout our watershed through this planning process, that those who receive the grants to do the recovery come to the tribe first and ask us what types of plants we want out there, what types of conditions are we looking for. So we're restoring not only uh, the salmon, but our culture. I think as far as our plan for the uh, cultural sustainability process, uh, we, we've been working on this for a, a number of years, but formally just starting now and collecting the information and putting the structure in place. But I, I think for the long term, we'll have the ability to go to our tribal members and say that we're doing what we can to secure their future. Thank you.